Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. My name is Jill Foos. I'm a functional medicine and integrative nutrition health coach. I created this podcast to bring you along as we travel down intriguing science-packed roads, debunking old medical paradigms and perusing new innovative therapies and modalities with the finest functional medicine doctors, practitioners, and like-minded biohackers while living our best life. Enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode on the Health Trip Podcast. Today, we are talking about all things related to midlife women's skin health. Have you noticed sagging skin, dry skin, dark spots, changes in volume, more acne? How about less brightness of your skin? Welcome to another chapter in your menopause life. And just like in the world of nutrition, the internet is saturated with a lot of skin health noise. We are told what to use, what not to use, what to put here, what to put there. And it is super confusing and can be very expensive. So Dr. Lady Dye has come back for a second episode on the Health Trip podcast to talk about the science on women's skin health. And we get into the nitty gritty of all of it. Dr. Dai is a board certified um, MD in dermatology, and she has 20 years expertise in this field. Dr. Dai founded Dai Dermatology Center. She held several positions simultaneously at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, and she was a dermatologist and assistant professor along with the department's cosmetic surgeon. She also served as the director of dermapathology and the director of the Rush Dermatology Medical Residency Program, where dermatology residents flourished under her guidance. Dr. Dai has clinical experience in hair loss and pigmentation disorders, including ethnic skin and hair disorders. Dr. Dai continuously researches, explores, and analyzes current therapies and technological advancements so that she can provide unsurpassed care to all of her patients. So if you remember last season and season two, she came and talked um, about hair loss and it's a fabulous episode. So if that is something that you're also dealing with in your menopausal transition, I highly recommend going back and listening to that podcast. A uh, short medical disclaimer before we begin, by listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice or to make any lifestyle changes to treat any medical condition in yourself or others. Consult your physician for any medical issues that you may be having. And this entire disclaimer also applies to any of my guests on my podcast. So sit back, open your mind, and let's dive into skin health. Hi, Dr. Dai. Welcome back to another episode. Hi, Jill. So looking forward to having, uh, you know, this uh, discussion today. Yeah, my the episode that you and I did together last season on hair loss was such a huge hit. It really helped so many women um, understand on a deeper level what was going on and really all the different um, options out there. And I hope to capture that again today with you on our skin health. You know, we're talking about midlife women, menopausal women, and all of a sudden you wake up one day, you look in your, the mirror and you're like, what the heck just happened? Like what's going on? Why, what is this wrinkle? And, you know, is, is the only thing I can do getting Botox and getting all of these expensive treatments, not to say that those are not okay to do, but we want to really understand what's going on in the midlife woman's life that's affecting her skin health. And then what are those lifestyle behaviors we can do? And, and we'll just continue on that discussion from there. So let's start off with what's happening. What's going on with the skin? Um, so when we're talking about midlife, you know, we're, we're really, uh, I, I mean, you know, my, um, I think that you, want to say like really estrogen, low estrogen levels, you know, in a woman's body, because you don't necessarily have to be menopause for you to experience some of these changes of low estrogen. So we'd like to refer it to as uh, estrogen deficient skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because a lot of these changes can be happening even before the actual menopause, because technically the scientific definition, as you, you know, I'm sure already know that you have to have like absence of a period for 12 consecutive months. But, you know, again, you know, even before the actual menopause ensues, one can actually go through a lot of the, you know, different changes that can happen. 
Yeah. Perimenopause can start as early as you know 35 for some women. So you can be in that stage for seven to 15 years. Um, so a lot of changes are going on. And one of those is skin health. And so let's start off with talking about what is our skin made of? What are the most important layers that women should okay. be aware of? Yes. So, I mean, you know, the, this is probably the more boring section of the topic because we're going to get into the really exciting section. Yeah. But just to build the background, there are three layers to the skin. The most superficial layer of the tissue is called the epidermis. So what's the epidermis? What does that do? Well, the most important function really is it acts as a barrier to entry of, you know, pathogenic organisms, microorganisms. Now, in addition to that, though, what we don't really realize is that the epidermis, that surface layer, also holds a lot of lipids or, or, or like, you know, uh, it repels, you know, the um, entry of uh, water, essentially, because it contains a lot of lipids. Then the other thing that it contains is the pigment. So we can't underestimate that, you know, that that's also part of the epidermis. Then the second layer of the tissue is what builds, what, what, what uh, I would say makes up majority of the uh, tissue, and that's called the dermis. And that's where you find your collagen, um, you know, which helps, uh, um, I, I would say, it's what gives the structure to your tissue. You have your elastic fibers is what's responsible for elasticity of the tissue, like the rebound. And then all that is actually embedded in what we call the extracellular matrix or hyaluronic acid. And hyaluronic acid is really what attracts a lot of the water, what holds the moisture. Then the third layer is essentially your fat. Um, you've got your uh, connective tissue covering for the muscle. And then finally, you have the bone. So really, there's three layers to the um, skin. So how is estrogen deficiency affecting those layers? And yeah. what's, that, what's that pathway? Oh my gosh. There's... Uh, in simple, um, in simple terms. Yeah, no, no, I, yeah, I, I, you know, because estrogen can do so many things and skin really is just one of the many things that it can affect. So from the epidermal, uh, uh, you know, standpoint, it causes skin thinning, number one. And that's why clinically, you know, a lot, like the women will tell you that, you know, I'm getting so bruised so easily. I mean, not to mention that there, there could potentially be other issues, but that is one of the issues because their skin is thinner. So when your skin is thinner, your blood vessels are actually like, you know, um, they're more prone to trauma, right? Because you don't mm -hmm. have that, uh, that uh, cushion. So that's one. Now, the other things are the dryness because you really lose the ability to hold on to um, uh, moisture or hydration. So patients will, you know, complain about dryness. Then the other thing that can happen if you're dry, well, guess what? You know, you're also going to be more wrinkly or pruny looking, you know, so your wrinkles are going to start appearing. You don't make as much collagen because if you recall what I talked about, the second layer of the, uh, of the tissue is made up of a lot of collagen. So you don't produce as much collagen. So if you don't produce as much collagen, you don't produce as much elastic tissue, you couple that with, you know, decrease in moisture. Well, you, you end up with like, I mean, I don't want to be mean, but you end up with like a prune, like, you know, surface tissue. And that's why, you know, you kind of like wake up one, one morning and you're like, oh my God, I didn't have that wrinkle. Where, where did that come from? You know? And then you're like, oh, it's probably bed lines. Oh, you know, it's probably this, you know, when in fact, oh my gosh, you know, you, we kind of forget that, you know, we're in menopause. So, yeah. Yeah. So before we move on from collagen, I want to talk about what supports collagen, um, the production of collagen naturally in our body. And there's a few nutrients out there or, and also a lot of foods out there that I think are really important for women to know, because at the same time, our skin is degrading, our waist is expanding, right? <laughs> and right. I so like women are thinking, oh my gosh, I've put on this belly fat I, that I've never had before overnight. Right. And so now I'm going to eat differently. I'm going to, you know, some women drastically drop their calories, which is the worst thing we can do because then we experience other, um, other things like hair loss or even more loss of our skin volume. 
So let's talk about the production of collagen and let's talk about collagen powders because every, so many women buy collagen powders. Are they all the same? What are we supposed to focus on? But so, so let's start with the nutrients. What is important to have in our diet in order to support collagen production? That, that, that's a very good point. So I think we have to understand what, you know, what is collagen, right? J j just like you said. So collagen is made up of protein. Proteins are made up of amino acids. So where do we get this, right? So, I mean, you know, the, 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 we get it from our diet. So if you are thinking about drastically lowering your caloric intake and not take enough proteins, well, guess what? You know, your fibroblasts are not going to be able to make collagen because you don't have the building blocks to make it. And right. the just the same thing as the hair, because hair is made up of not over 90% protein. And that's why you commonly see hair loss, you know, with uh, restrictive, you know, caloric intake. So as far as what do we need to take it? Protein is the number one thing, but protein is not the only thing, right? Because right. like, you know, it, it, like, you know, I think of the food chart as like the many different colors of um food. So if you eat the greens, the blueberries or the blues, the uh, oranges, the reds, the apples, you know, and then your browns are your like nuts, you get a lot of trace minerals from nuts. That's also so important in yeah. skin health. So I, 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 you know, I mean, the nutrition plays a super big role. And um, just like you said, uh, you know, we get fat deposition in areas where we don't want it, but that's also another thing that est depletion in estrogen does to our body. Yeah, for sure. I want to just put a shout out to vitamin C and zinc, because those are two really important nutrients that are in, that are precursors to manufacture your body's ability to manufacture or produce collagen. So super right. important to always include those. And if those are not things that are readily available to you, if you aren't someone who's big on eating oysters or you're not getting enough animal proteins, there's ways to supplement, right? And one of those ways could be a lot of people think collagen powder. Okay. Well, at least I'm going to get some collagen, but I would like to say collagen powder is not a complete protein source. So you're right. not getting all of the amino acids that you need, but it is something that can be used as a wonderful supplement, especially if you're using the right form of collagen. And let's just talk a little bit about that. What is the right form of collagen if we're just talking about skin health? So what I mean, you, I, I like marine collagen. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's sort of the source of collagen that I like better. I like hydrolyzed collagen. All that really means, you know, that the, they're kind of like um, in smaller uh, chains of um of uh, collagen, uh, you know, uh, links of amino acids so that they're easily uh, digestible. So to me, you know, I'm more of a marine collagen, but not to say that you you, you can't have bovine collagen, but bovine collagen is going to be better for your joints. Um, so marine collagen really is what my, my go-to and uh, it's great for the hair and great for skin. Yeah. Have you seen any of the studies on something called Verisol? Yes. Um, coll collagen peptides. Yes. So, um, so that's what I use vital proteins. Those are very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They make one. And so it says, it'll say the word Verisol, it's a proprietary blend of specific collagen. And there were some studies that I read that said it actually increases your, um, your skin collagen production by 15% more than regular collagens. So these were, I think, randomized controlled studies. Um, so th I think that's really interesting, really looking at the form that you're buying um, in terms of what collagen powder you're going to spend your money on, Absolutely. right? Get the, get the most bang for your buck here. Exactly. Because they're not all created equal. Yep. I mean, there's a lot of marketing and, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar business. For so. sure. Yep. All right. Let's pivot to... Um, what are the biggest drivers of poor skin health? So we mentioned a couple of things like diet, right? But what are also some of these things moving the dial in an adverse direction? Sun damage. That's your number one thing. And that's the number one thing that you can do every single day for yourself is to put on sunscreen. And we've shown that time and time again, you know, if you don't put on your sunscreen, you, I mean, you know, I mean, other than, no photo protection to your top layer of your epidermis, you actually degrade your collagen and you chew it up in little bits and pieces. You chew up the elastic fibers and, you know, so, so, so that's one of the, 
um, uh, uh, I would say biggest, uh, like the most important thing that you could do for yourself other than your diet, lifestyle, you know, I mean, that's very important, you know, as well. Um, you know, if you're smoking, you know, you're, you're, you're introducing a lot of uh, reactive oxygen species or like, you know, things that are very oxid, like that could induce oxidative damage. Yeah. So when we're talking about sun damage, I have a few questions on this. One is one of the ways that people can reset their circadian rhythm every day is getting out early morning when the sun is, you know, at sunrise, right? So around that time where the sun is at that, that low horizon and getting those rays in to hit the neurons in your eyes, which then stimulate that circadian 24 hour clock. Right. But if we go out there and it's, you know, 637, 730 in the morning, and we're getting this low, these low horizon rays, and we're not wearing sunscreen, and we're out there for 10, 15 minutes, is that still going to cause a problem? Because don't we want some vitamin D to hit exactly. our skin? So the American Academy of Dermatology recommendation is a five to 10 minute sun exposure without getting burned. See, the, 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 the issue is not so much you know, getting some sunlight. The issue is more of if you burn your tissue, then you're at increased risk of, you know, basal cell carcinoma. But just like you said, vitamin D metabolism, you know, happens on the skin surface. So we do want some of that to happen, but a five to 10 minute exposure every day without sunscreen is actually adequate. And then the rest of the vitamin D, you know, we get it from other sources. Yeah. So when we're talking about sunscreen, there's, you know, people are, do I, are, are confused over mineral based versus the more generic types you buy, what are we supposed to be using? Okay. So, um, there are two types of sunscreens, right? You can get your mineral based sunscreen, just like you said, and then your chemical sunscreen, mineral based sunscreens are things that would read as titanium dioxide, zinc oxides. And it's nice to use that because it reflects the sunlight. So what that means is as soon as you put it on, it's working so that when you go out the door, you know, in 30 seconds, you know, you're reflecting that ultraviolet light radiation. But when you're using a chemical based sunscreen, not only that you have, you know, you have to wait for that sunscreen really to penetrate through the top layer of the epidermis for it to start working. And that can take anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. Now, one can make an argument that, you know, well, so, you know, I mean, that's fine. But the problem is, you know, we, we try to reduce as much chemicals as possible. Sometimes it's okay to use a combo because there's a lot of sun, no, there's a lot of sunscreens that will do a combo mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you, you like the combo if you're going to be out playing golf, because you can't really reapply sunscreen continuously, because if you're perspiring, you know, and if you wipe off your, your sweat, you're not necessarily wiping off the sunscreen because you've got a little bit of that chemical, but I, ideally we do want to limit the, uh, you know, chemical exposure, even for sunscreens. Yeah, for sure. And what about, um, um, what was the other thing you were just talking about? Sun. Well, I'm going to make a comment about the, I mean, you know, I, I just came back for, for from the, uh, you know, here, uh, you know, um, world here, Congress meeting. And, yeah. um, there was something about the sunscreen that I thought I would just mention that I thought it was really interesting because they are now attributing some of these chemicals to a specific hair condition called frontal fibrosing alopecia. Mm. So, yeah. So, you know, I, you know, I just thought, you know, I had just had to uh, mention that because there's such an increase um, incidence and prevalence of that particular condition. And they think it might be related to sunscreen, but I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that is really interesting. And what I was going to ask you was alcohol consumption, right? So we now know there's, there's no benefits to drinking alcohol and, but it's, it's part of our social exactly. community life, right? Not everybody. I, I don't drink alcohol. That's my preference. It doesn't make me feel good. It brings zero to the table for me, for other people. They really enjoy a glass of wine or having a cocktail with their friends. So zero judgment here, but I want to know what is the <laughs> science behind when we drink alcohol and its effect on aging skin is there any oh yeah there's definitely i mean i'm like 
like you, I've never had alcohol, so I don't drink alcohol, you know, that this is not part of my, you, you know. Um, so anyway, so what, so there's a lot of things that alcohol can do, but the, the first thing that I can think about is actually rosacea. When you have redness prone skin, um, when you do drink alcohol, a lot of the patients will tell you that, hey, you know, I feel like, you know, my redness is worsened or like, you know, I'm flushing. Well, that's because alcohol has a vasodilatory type of an effect and that dilates your blood vessels. And when you keep dilating and constricting the blood vessels, well, you know, as you keep doing that, they stay open after a while, and then you get these permanent uh, redness. You develop these, you know, tiny little broken blood vessels on the skin surface, you know, and I mean, they're not terrible, but a lot of patients will feel a lot of heat, that, yeah. right? And then yeah. some of them, you know, I mean, then you go through menopause on top of that, then it, work, you know, just everything worsens. Um, alcohol can induce a lot of, uh, you know, what we call oxidative, uh, you know, damage and oxidative damage is, I mean, it's just not good for the tissue. So when should women really start thinking about their skin health? We're talking about alcohol and I'm thinking to myself, you know, my kids are all in their twenties. I have one daughter. <laughs> they love being, you know, on vacation and being in the sun. And so Let's just back up a little. When are we supposed to start thinking about this? I personally think that you can't start early enough, you know, because as a teenager, you know, one can argue and say that, you know, you want to at least like, you know, not be obsessive over it. Right. But at least think about it because, you know, you're going to have acne. I mean, that's the perfect age where you're going to have, you know, you're going to start having little acne, little clog pores. So if you start early and, 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 and really build like, you know, good skin habits, right. Good behavioral, that's going to carry you through because then in your twenties, you know, you, you, you 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 can still have acne in your 20s, you know, or you can have rosacea. And then in your 30s, you know, well, we know that, you know, I mean, with, with like, you know, you know, I'm just going to correlate it with estrogen that your maximum output or your maximum level, the height of your estrogen production really is going to be in your 20s. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> after your 30s, you know, then you actually start sort of seeing like a plateau and then then you start the perimenopausal years in your 40s, then you start seeing a decline. So I personally think that, you know, um, you can't start early enough really to establish, uh, you know, good skin habits. Yeah, absolutely. And if you are that person or were that person who like for, for me, for example, we grew up, we had a pool in our backyard. So we were always at the pool. We had oil on us. We didn't have, you know, we were baking with the, um, those foil, you, you know, those foil fold outs. So it would reflect the sun back <laughs> to you. Right. I mean, we were out there a long time, you know, I'm blessed with nice skin. My mom has nice skin and skin. There is a genetic yeah. component to having that nice skin. Nice <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sure. Right. But if you do a lot of damage when you're younger, can you reverse the damage when you get to midlife? You, you definitely can. It, it's just going to take a little bit more work, you know, but, but it's definitely going to be reversible. Absolutely. I mean, there's, I, I, you know, we've made so much strides, so much, you know, uh, progress in terms of understanding, understanding the science of, you know, how can we reverse some of these, uh, you know, um, um, damage that we did when we were younger. So that, that there's plenty. And, uh, you know, if you want me to go into it, you know, you know, I can talk about like a simple as the vitamin C that you that you've talked about, you know, it can increase collagen production. It can also brighten this, the skin because it does decrease the activity of the melanocytes for making the pigment. And that's how it brightens the tissue. We have retinol, you know, that, that can work at a, uh, you know, DNA nuclear receptor where it really changes how, you, you know, the um, body can make these proteins, which equals to collagen. So that, that that's one of them. Um, we have hyaluronic acid, you know, molecules that we can apply topically. There's, you know, the, the, the small hyaluronic acid molecules, the large hyal hyaluronic acid molecules, typically what's, what's combined in these products um, 
uh, you know, are a combination of both. And what do they do? They add moisture back to the tissue. So there are a lot of things out there that yeah. can definitely yeah. help. There yeah, is. we're we're gonna dig into all of that um, in just a minute. But speaking of HA, um, lots of studies coming out saying that taking an oral supplement is better and more effective than using it topically. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think you have to do both. Um, hmm. You know, I don't think that you know taking HA is going to be is going to replace your topical HA. You know, I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I mean, just like collagen and, and a good nutrition, you know, I believe in both. You have yeah. to eat well. And at the same time, you can do extra by, you know, taking that Verisol uh, collagen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. All right. Let's get to some really uh, fun topics right now. Um, the first is skincare routine. So many women have a routine. Like I know mine, I, mine's probably a little more simple than most people, but I know I have some friends who, you know, it's a 30 minute ordeal morning and night, right? It's just, it's a lot. <laughs> mine's not like that, but there is confusion over how to layer these products, right? What are you starting with? Um, even what are you cleansing your face with to how much time in between each layer do you have to wait? So all of those things, let's start with um, an AM routine. What is a really healthy um, baseline to start with? So there are general principles that, you know, or, or yeah, uh, uh, I would say general principles that we want to follow. And then, you know, er everything can be customized, right? Because just like you said, you know, you kind of like a simpler routine. I definitely like a very simple routine. <laughs> but then just like you, you said, we have friends who, you know, it's mm -hmm. like a, a 30 minute thing, right? So right. it's really whatever fits your lifestyle. But the basic principles are you want to cleanse your skin, right, in the morning. Now, if cleansing your skin is going to be at the expense of taking away hydration, well, then you don't want to cleanse with, you know, with anything that's going to be very astringent. So you can just cleanse with, with water because the assumption is that, you know, you clean your tissue really well the night of. So I want to start out by talking about cleansing the skin. So the, the, the basic principle is that you want to cleanse with something that has like, you know, as I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, more mature skin, something with a glycolic acid type of a cleanser. Uh, why glycolic acid, you know, because the, 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 they're pretty, I mean, yes, it's, it, it's acidic, but it can penetrate through the corneocytes, which is the, you, you know, the uh, cells that's um, on top of the um, uh, skin surface. And what does it do? It separates them out so that it allows the next step of what you're going to put on penetrate into the mm -hmm. tissue. It takes away the lipids, it takes away the dirt. And then after you cleanse, then the next principle is I like to do a vitamin C topically. Um, Wait, and, so go, go back to the cleanser for a second. So what would be some good options? Um, and maybe that's how we'll do this is we'll talk about options as we go through the layers, because there are some people who need to be on a budget. There are people who do not want to take out a second mortgage on their home just to have healthy skin, right? <laughs> but then there are people who really yeah. want those medical grade products that they buy at their doctor's office. Um, so can you give us some examples of, of, of yeah. both, if you don't mind. No, no, I don't mind at all. So, uh, and, and we're okay to talk about brands, right? Yeah, you, for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause I'm so used to giving lectures where, you know, yeah. right. And talk about brands. Yeah, no, I think but, brands yeah. are great. La Roche-Posay has, you know, excellent, you know, glycolic acid cleansers. Um, I, you know, even Neutrogena for somebody who has acne, right? You know, I mean, it, it's excellent with salicylic acid cleansers. Um, now, if you do have a, what I say, drier skin, that, but you still want to be able to cleanse and feel like you're, you're cleansing, um, you have a mild facial cleanser by Avino. Um, if you want like CeraVe cleansers, Cetaphil gentle cleansers, these are just amongst the, the few that's out in the market. 
Now, if you're talking about, you know, you want a little bit more, meaning, you know, they have some glycolic acid, but they are somehow wrapped in liposomes or nanosomes. So we're getting a little bit fancier, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're still getting your cleansing activity without that drying effect. Then, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'll recommend things like the, you know, Zio or Zenobaji, you know, has a nice cleanser. Um, SkinCeutical has a great mm -hmm. cleanser. It's a it's called a glycolic creamy uh, wash. Um, you know, it's got glycolic acid, but it's delivered in such a way in a vehicle that's very, very mild. So there's really, really lots of choices out there. Now, some people after cleansing, they like to do a toner because mm -hmm. they want to readjust the pH of the tissue. Um, but then we're talking about that's another step, right? Right. So I, I, you know, I tend not to do, you know, not to use a toner because it's another step. You know, I feel that, you know, once I cleanse my skin, I pat dry. I don't wait for it to be completely dry because if you do, then you won't get as much absorption of the second product that you put on. So it's really best to put on the second product when your skin is still slightly moist. Then my... My choice of product is an antioxidant product, which is a vitamin C product. Now, vitamin C is meant to be used in the morning, not meant to be used in the evening. I tell my patients that all the time because it does have antioxidative properties. It, the vitamin C naturally has an SPF anywhere between five to seven, depending on the vitamin mm. C concentration. Yeah, um, but... And, and it stays in your skin cells for 24 hours. So there is no reason to reapply vitamin C. It is gradually released into the tissue. So you just do that in the morning. Um, generally speaking, because you asked the question, how do you layer them? Generally speaking, thin to thick. So, you know, if you're going to do a serum in the morning, that's usually pretty thin. And then you can follow it up if you want with a moisturizer. I tend to do a moisturizing sunscreen because I don't want too many steps. Yeah. So that's what I do. And I use a mineral sunscreen. As far as sunscreen, oh my gosh, we have so, so many, you know, sunscreen out there that is so affordable. Now, now the cosmetic grade, you know, it's it's a little bit nicer because the vehicle is nicer and then it may also be higher percentage of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide and still look cosmetically elegant and that's what you're paying for when you're getting something that is a cosmeceutical grade really higher percentage of uh, you know um uv radiation protection without sacrificing the appearance yeah okay then so you have the tinted and the non-tinted oh yeah i like oh, the sorry. tinted no, I agree. I like the tinted. So I just want to make a comment about the tinted because that's really important because not every patient of mine likes the tinted. Mm -hmm. If you do have any pigmentary issues like melasma, it is really important for you to use the tinted because believe it or not, we are on our phones all day long and this emits some light, right? We are on the desktop, you know, on the computer, it's emitting some light. Mm. Our light above, you know, the ultraviolet light that's also emitting some light and the tinted actually Actually, you know, protects you from those lights that's being emitted from those devices and the non-tinted doesn't. So oh, that's genius. I never knew that, but that makes yeah. so much sense. Yeah. So that's really important. Yeah. I want to circle back to the toners. The vitamin C is pretty basic. There's a lot of different yeah. droppers and that's pretty basic. I think everyone's familiar with that, but the toners, there's a lot of toners out there. And so I've been in preparation of, of seeing you today. I did a little bit of research and there's all these new DNA type serums, right? And then there's regular serums. So can you talk about the difference of all these serums and which ones we should be using during midlife uh, versus ones that might not be the most beneficial to achieve our goals? Okay. So when, when you talk about DNA serums, what exactly do you mean by that? There's um, products out there that say they're DNA recovery serums. So they have specific uh, compounds or properties in them that help um, rejuvenate on a, uh, on a D you got it. Okay. Take it yeah. away. No, 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 I got it. No, no, no. So, so I think, you know, it's a marketing catchphrase and that's why, you know, it, it didn't resonate with 
with me. So a DNA recovery serum, what that means is that they have this molecule that's acting at a nuclear receptor DNA level. And an example of that would be retinol or, well, ret retinoic acid in the prescription grade and retinol in the market or, 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 or like, you know, or, or peptides. That's that's another one of the uh, serums that they they talk about. Um, vitamin, uh, you know, like different types of vitamin B12, you know, and niacinamide. Those are some of the uh, DNA serums that, I, I, you know, I think that you're talking about unless, you know, you have some other things in mind. So someone could be out there potentially buying three different serums, thinking they're three different products and they're really not three different products, but, uh, they're, yeah. but they're marketed differently. Yes, correct. You really have to look at, at the back <clears throat> of the label. I mean, you know, that, that that's really something consumers should really be savvy about is look at what's, you know, what's in it. I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, like, I personally don't, I don't even read what, you know, what's on the label on the outside. I always go to the back and I look at what's the active ingredient and what's the inactive ingredients, because that to me says it all. And the Mary, rest is that is so interesting, huh? Okay. So yeah. as far as retinol or, um, tretinoin, those, so tretinoin being the prescription grade, retinol being the commercial grade, those are considered DNA type serums. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you can also buy just something that says DNA serum on it, but it doesn't have retinol in it. So why, so why shouldn't those two be used together? You can, if you want, but uh, you know, really at the end of the day is knowing what do these ingredients really offer you, you know, like, you know, the, the, there's no, I mean, there's really no need to be using um, another form of retinol if you can tolerate retinol. The only way that, I mean, the only time that I personally will seek out DNA, uh, 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 you know, um, reversing types of products are going to be if you cannot tolerate retinol. So for example, I cannot tolerate retinol. So I actually tend to use Bacultrol because Bacultrol is the plant derived retinol. It works like retinol, but it's derived from, from plants. So it's a lot gentler. So in the studies, you know, the effects of Bacultrol is very comparable to the effects of medical grade retinol but I don't have as much of a choice in terms of, um, uh, uh, I would say the strength of the cultural because it only comes mm. from strength. Okay. And so I've always heard that retinol should be used in your evening routine versus, right. okay. So if retinol is, we're going to say that for the evening routine, but we're still in the morning routine. So oh, a I serum, right. right. So we wouldn't use retinol as one of our layers. We would use one of these DNA type serums um you you could if you want but then it kind of depends on i mean you know if you're only trying to achieve if it's going to behave like retinol and the and the end point is to get collagen production uh, you know i don't need another one of that so you're saying you could potentially just do cleansing your face the vitamin c mm -hmm. and then go straight to your your sunscreen that's what I do. And then at night is when I actually layer more things because I don't have time to do that in the morning. So the basic principles is that you want to always use one vitamin C, one DNA like, you know, reversing products like a retinol or Bacultrol or, you know, something along those lines, one growth factor type of a serum or, or an exosome kind of a serum, you know, because they're kind of like categorized in the same category. And then a really good moisturizer so that you can replenish your hyaluronic acid, your lipids, for example. So that's sort of the basic premise. Now you decide if, when do you want to do more of your moisturizing? It's typically usually done in the evening because your regenerative process happens in the evening. And that's why that's where I spend most of my time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You're saving people a lot of money right now in their morning routine, but I'm going to throw something else out there. I've got another um, product, estrogen cream. 
or yes. estriol, right? <laughs> Well, I want to talk about the difference between some people using their vaginal estrogen cream, which some doctors say that they can use on their face. So that's E2 versus estriol, which is E3, um, which is not as strong as E2. So talk about, there are a lot of companies out there now marketing estrogen-based creams for your face. Um, and then of course, there's going to your doctor and maybe getting one that is exactly what it should be from a compounding pharmacy. So talk about those differences there. So I think the bottom line is, uh, you, you know, I think the verdict is still out, uh, you know, it, it's still out, meaning we, we don't really have enough data, I think, to say that the estriol cream uh, really works. You know, if you look at the studies out there, there, I mean, you know, the, the, there's a good number of studies, but if you look at the number of people that that they've done it on, if you look at where they've actually applied these these things to, they're not all on the face. Some of them, you know, some are on the thighs, some are on the arms. You know, at least those are, those are the studies that I'm aware of. There's just not a lot of control, and I don't really know that we really have enough data to say that that the estriol is going to be better than. E2 is going to be better than E3 and that these are not going to have any side effects. So personally, you know, I cannot talk to the patient and tell the patient that, hey, you know, you really should be doing the estriol cream because the estriol cream really has been shown that it's superior to estradiol and that you're going to get all these benefits without any side effects. And so I'm a little bit leery about that. Now, even with compounding pharmacy, because there are different grades of compounding pharmacy too, you know, I mean, the, 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 the FDA is not really able to, you know, uh, uh, put their paws or police all the compounding pharmacies. So it's kind of scary for me because somebody may say, I'm only putting in, you know, a certain percentage, you know, of um, estriol in this cream, but how do I really know that's the truth? Because there has been lots of reports where these compounding pharmacies, I mean, I'll just tell you about the minoxidil because for very long, I mean, there was a good period of time where minoxidil actually, oral minoxidil was not available. So compounding pharmacies was actually dispensing minoxidil. And there's been report reports of hospitalization secondary to people taking minoxidil. And we only give a tiny, tiny minute amount of minoxidil and then when they went went back and looked at the, the pills, it was a thousand times more than what the recommended doses coming from a compounding pharmacy because there's just they're just so unregulated. So yeah. by definition, estriol cream, estradiol cream, they should be regulated uh, pharmaceutical compounds, right? Because yeah. I mean that that that's that's the only way because you will never be able to find an estriol, you know, cream right. from Walgreens, right? Never. So, so I think the jury's still out there, but initial studies though have shown that you know a, a estrogen containing product for the skin has shown positive effects, but I would not use the uh, you know estrogen cream the, the vaginal you know, area to the I face agree. because there's also been reports that patients are getting yeast infections on their face when they use the estradiol cream for the vaginal area there's also been reports about patients getting melasma like like this brown pigmentation on the face when they are using these non-regulated you know um cream so i so i think that's that, that's kind of where i'm coming from but now in the dermatology world there is actually a product called emapel i'm not sure if you've come across that no. mm -mm. cream so um emapel is a cream that has a synthetic uh, estrogen so it's synthetic it's not your you know um but it only mimics the functions of estrogen without the actual estrogenic type of effects of like, you know, breast mm. tenderness, you know, vaginal. Yep. yep. It doesn't do that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been well studied and in the studies, they've definitely shown that it increased hydration, it improved the wrinkles, et cetera. But, you know, it, it's, it's like a full line and then their, their, their evening cream comes with retinol and some niacinamide and hyaluronic acid. So they're all kind of compounded together. 
Um, but but that, that's one of the things that I would be very comfortable recommending because I know exactly what's in it and it's regulated, but it, it is not a prescription product. Hmm, interesting. Really interesting. I'm sure we're going to see a lot of studies and a lot of data and a lot of products being marketed with estrogen in it oh very God. soon. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because patients yeah. bring it into me. Uh, you know, yeah. you know, you know, I'm using this cream and I'm like, oh, where'd you get that? You know, some online thing, some internet. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. All right. So now we've, we've had that conversation. I want to circle back to our evening routine and close out our skin routine here. So we've got our AM routine. Now we're talking about the evening. So again, the cleansing again, but this time we're not going to be using the vitamin C because you oh. said that that stays in for 24 hours. So we don't need to do that. So now we're going to some type of serum or retinol or both. If that's something that someone wants to do. Exactly. Because now we really want to focus on regenerating the tissue nighttime, you're sleeping, you're resting, all of your system is pretty much kind of like turned off. So you really want to take advantage of your mitochondria so that they can work really hard and regenerate. And that's where I really pamper my skin. <laughs> that, that's what I do. So I, I take my time and I do rinse my, my face. I will use a toner actually, you know, for my uh, nighttime routine, after I do use my toner, I actually then will either reach out for my exosome, my topical exosomes. I'm not sure if you're, you know, if yep. you're familiar with up. So yeah, but I, what what would the what would that product look like? Oh, so my it, it's it, it's in a serum because it's a very concentrated mm -hmm. form. Serums are typically more concentrated. That's why they're not mixed with a lot of other things. You know, they're they're pretty watery. Yeah. Um, and so the topical exosomes, a uh, you know, a medical grade one is called plated. It's derived from platelets, so that's one of them. And then uh, there's there's another one that. Um, you know, I like, it's called Elevate and that's derived from the umbilical cord, but you have to be comfortable with the idea of using topical exosomes. I am very comfortable because, you know, I know that it, it's terrific for regenerating and it can do a lot of things. It can improve your pigment. It can improve your vasculature. So it decreases your redness and it can also make a lot of collagen to improve your fine lines and wrinkles. And it also increases your hydration. So I use it pretty much as, you know, it, it's the it's the go-to product. If I was a little bit energetic in the morning, I actually will also use my topical exosomes in the morning after the vitamin C serum, you know, I'll slip the exosomes and then my moisturizing sunscreen. So going back to the night routine, so I'll do my exosomes. Now, I, you know, I also have growth factors because I used to use growth, growth factor serum. So I just want to mention that, you know, for, for, for the people who's not comfortable with topical exosomes, because they are derived from, you know, another human being, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, as your source. So you can use growth factor serum growth, growth factors are essentially, you know, um, made in a laboratory, but they're identified to promote collagen production. And um, uh, uh, so that's what I use, used to use, but I've now changed it to a topical exosome. Then after my topical exosome- Wait, so where do you, where do you buy growth factor serum? Oh, uh, so uh, well, well, the growth factor serum that I'm familiar with, uh, you know, is a um, cos cosmetic grade. That, yep. Skin Medica makes one of the best one called the Advanced TNS. Um, that, that, that's a beautiful, uh, you know, uh, growth factor, um, Lumiere. Um, by uh, Neocutis, uh, you know, they also mm -hmm. make a uh, really good growth factor. And there's some, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's fairly common now, the uh, growth factor, uh, Defenage, uh, you know, has some growth factor, and I particularly like Defenage, but that's a cosmeceutical grade too, but I particularly like them because their growth factor is derived from, it's a molecule called Defensin, which is directly related to stem cells. Mm. So, and, and fair, well studied, you know, everything I'm telling you is very well studied because I will not, I refuse to carry anything that is not well studied. And what I mean by well studied, they've actually shown it, you know, they wrote pa papers, they, they've shown patients before and after they measured hydration, they've measured the amount of wrinkles, you know, I mean, everything has just been uh, really clinically evaluated. Um, and then I um, will top it off with a really good moisturizer. 
if I'm particularly feeling extra dry, for example, you know, I will actually do a carboxy mask, you know, which is a CO2 uh, derived uh, mask that increases oxygen, you know, production in my skin. If I have, for example, like a special event the next day, like a wedding to go to, a party to go to, I will then, you know, like do an extra special treatment and do the carboxy mask. But carboxy mask, we know for sure that it in it increases your hydration by 300% after one application. Wow. And so this is a, this is a mask that you leave on overnight. Uh, you leave it on for 60 minutes and then it actually kind of like semi coagulates and hardens, and then you just peel it away and then you will significantly feel very lifted. And then I just slap on my moisturizer and I go to bed. So you're doing those other layers and then doing this mask and then peeling the mask off and then topping off with your moisturizer. Yes. So that mask isn't taking away any of the layers you just previously used. It's actually enhancing penetration. Wow. The products. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, and is no, that something people can buy over the counter or is that cosmetic uh, grade? The, car the carboxy mask is cosmetic grade, but it is available though on online. Um, yep. So you could actually just look it up carboxy mass. You know, I, I, I mean, not, I mean, you know, I just want to mention, cause you know, I do have a, uh, you know, shopping website, so yep. you can get it from the shopping website. Yeah. I'll link all of that information at, yeah, the, at yeah. the end, but, but Jill, if you haven't tried it, you know, it's a must try I'm telling you. Oh yeah. So, but that's not a nightly thing. That's just for like no. what you're saying, a special event coming up the next day. Exactly. Or I mean, you know, I, I because because not a lot of your viewers probably are already on all of these things that we're talking about. So if you are thinking about doing it, you know, so you're going to need to have a little bit more like a um, head start. So mm -hmm. if you want to have a head start, I would recommend that you do the mask for three consecutive days and then start your routine because it will be much better received by your keratinocytes all hmm. the things that you're putting in because you're because we're pumping in a lot of oxygen right so we're kickstarting or driving your cells to work really hard but we're providing the right tools and the nutrition yep and that's yep. why it can work better so if you're thinking about doing it you know do it do it the right way you know jump start it you know but yep. if you're already on a routine and you've got a special location then try it out. But every single person I've recommended it to every single one, Jill, I'm telling you, they love it. Oh, I'm deaf. I'm on it. I am trying that out. <laughs> you try it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. So then where does the retinol come in? So I still love the retinol, you know, I just happen to not be able to, uh, you know, right. But where would that come in? Oh, would it be after the no. mask or before the mask? No. So the retinol will come in. So if you're if you're not using the mask, the um, so there, there's two ways of doing retinol. If you can tolerate retinol, you can actually use retinol. So after you rinse your face, you can actually do retinol first so that you can get the best absorption, right? If you can tolerate retinol. But I would say 90% of the people cannot tolerate the retinol because it's too drying. If you cannot tolerate the retinol, then you can put your other layers and then finally put the retinol and then you can put the mask on if you Got want. Got it. Got yeah. it. Okay. Because you're essentially creating a little bit of a barrier. So you're not absorbing as much of the retinol so that you're not too, you're not too dry. That's one way of doing it. Or you can do it every other day, or you can do it <laughs> once a week and then kind of like just titrate yourself up to being able to do it nightly. But I have always used retinol even in my twenties and I could never, I, I just could never do it. Yeah. it <laughs> Any, anything that we need to know about moisturizing? Many different grades of moisturizers, right? The type of moisturizers that you want to purchase, it's not one with silicone, you know, you don't want to do that. You want to get a moisturizer that will best mimic what's really in our tissue and what is that hyaluronic acid as well as ceramides because ceramides is are the lipids, um, uh, uh, you know, of your keratinocytes. So you want to at least have those two things. And then the rest are going to be essentially vitamins, emulsifiers, you know, I mean, those are also good stuff, but uh, I would say ceramides and then uh, sodium, uh, you know, um, different forms of uh, hyaluronic acid. Okay. 
let's pivot to what we should not be putting on our skin. I mean, there are people who still use Vaseline on their skin. I know, <laughs> I know, I know. I, know. Yeah. Um, I have to say that, you know, I have a soft spot for Vaseline. If you're like super, super dry, I mean, not, not, not on the face though, but like, you know, on your elbows, yeah. I, you, know, you know, I'm okay, you know, but yes, but uh, yes, um, Vaseline is, is the number one thing that can clog your pores. Uh, not a good idea to use. Um, now there are other, you know, uh, what I call sub substances that are probably uh, not just comedogenic, but also, you know, uh, cancer promoting substance, you know, I would definitely try to avoid, you know, those as well. And thankfully, you know, I think the, 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 the uh, you know, us here in the, in the US, you know, we have a lot of those awareness that we've kind of avoided, like, you know, sulfate free, paraben free, you know, we, you know, we, 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 we try to be free of those things. Yeah. But, I was going to ask you about that. You know, our, sometimes I don't know what I'm reading on the package, right? These, it's just these words, these ingredients that you of course would know, but the common consumer, we would never know what these are. Um, and so these, some of these medical grade products or these fancier grade products, are they free of all of these things? Should we just assume they're free or is it going to be on that package for us to read? Oh. Of course. Yeah. So we're talking about what are the absolute no's to put on our face? And are we supposed to be able to read on the product to avoid those, those um, sulfites, those parabens, those types of ingredients? Yeah. It, you, you know, it, it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult to actually decipher those, those things, even for me, because the, you know, these companies are becoming so much more savvy in, in, in you know, using these supposedly alternatives but they still have some of these ingredients in it. So a lot of times I actually have to be looking up things online myself to sort of understand. Um, I mean, you know, but thankfully to being in the medical field, you know, there's actually like a library of like an, an app for us to be able to look these things up quick, you know, uh, uh, quickly, but you really have to pay attention. Um, but, but a reputable company will usually, you know, just pretty much write out, say, paraben free, sulfate free, you know, so, so, so that's, so yeah. those are like the, the, the things that I would look for, because otherwise, you, you can spend so much time look, looking up things, it's just a waste of time. So absolutely, there is an app that I recommend to my clients, it's called oh. Think think dirty. Um, and it used to be really, really easy to use where you could just scan products, um, household cleaning products, toothpaste, deodorants, you know, all the basic skincare and body care. Um, and it would show you if it was, it would grade it in a green, yellow, or red zone. And then you can click on all these different links oh, and cool. it would show you the ingredients that are harmful, the studies that would show that it was harmful. The, the only Downside is, well, there's two. One is they just turned into a paid app, right? So now you have to pay for the information where it was free before. And two is these more medical grade type products that people are spending money on aren't on there. So it's definitely more for things that you'll be getting at like Target or Walmart or, you know, wherever. Um, but it's still dirty. Yeah. Think dirty. It's still a really good app. I, I yeah, do still highly good. recommend it. Yeah. Um, we're coming to the end of the podcast and I want to close off with two things. One is what's to do with Korean skincare. Why is it so good? What What's the hype? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, 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 uh, I think the Koreans have been really, uh, you know, um, they're very meticulous with their skincare. They, they, they have a lot of advancements with their skincare as well. And they are more, um, uh, 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 I would say they've taken a lot of the ancient, you know, Chinese medicine, and then they really have brought it into the Western world, you know, it's, so, so it's a marriage of both. And they, uh, you know, it's it just skincare has just been such an important part of their culture. Like every Korean woman, it doesn't matter so much as to their income level. They could be just making like, you know, a basic, right? They made it so affordable that every single person actually is doing something for their skin. I mean, if you talk to somebody just walking off the street, you know, I, I mean, they will tell you that they they get lasers done. So, so, but, but that's also because it's so much more affordable in that country as opposed mm -hmm. to 
this country, but they do a lot of science. I mean, the, the, they're obsessed over skincare and, um, you know, they're just very me me meticulous. Um, they have like this snail serum, you know, that, mm -hmm. that I don't know if you're, if you're yeah. familiar with, yeah, it, you know, there there is some truth to that, uh, you know, and that's one of the DNA serum that, uh, you know, that, that you're probably talking about, you know, but I would say that there are better serums out there. Not that it doesn't work. It, it is it is helpful, but if you're on a budget, right, and then time is very important. So I, I mean, you know, there's some truth to it, but it's just not worth the money because, um you know why spend the extra money when you can get the same impact by using something equivalent that's not that's not as expensive but it certainly is very attractive because it's more net it's more natural yeah um, they have lots of things there you know ginseng you know serum yeah. and you know you know all these uh you know different concoction um salmon dna uh, you know that that that's probably the best uh, one of the biggest rave right now is the use of salmon uh, DNA as a skin booster to help brighten the uh, skin. There's a ton and ton of uh, you know uh, scientific data behind that, and I I do have salmon DNA at my at my practice because they're able to really clinically show and validate the improvement that you're getting from using salmon DNA types of products. That's amazing. So obviously these are products that vegans would definitely not be um, purchasing, but I'm, I am not a vegan. I'm a carnivore. So <laughs> I would be all over it, but how do you know when you go to buy this stuff, if it's the real deal or it's just this, the Americanized version of it. Right. And so it's, it's, it's really hard to navigate that sea. That, 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 I mean, that, that's going to be the issue because they're only effective if you're getting a certain concentration of the yeah. product. So, uh, you know, um, one hint is that, you know, if you see a bunch of ingredients written and then the last thing that's written is the active ingredient, then you know that this thing yeah. is probably not going to work, right? Because yeah. they're always listed in the order of what concentration, you know, um, the uh the, the the stuff is made of yeah so yeah so, so i mean it, it, it's really very difficult and that's why you know i think finding a dermatologist or somebody that you trust such as your yourself jill as a resource who can help you navigate this very you, you know that shouldn't really be that complicated but has really now been so complicated because of all the available things that we have out there yeah. Yeah. You just reminded me of a, of a question I wanted to ask you when someone gets on a new skincare routine, how long until they can start seeing the effects given that they're also supporting this with a healthy lifestyle, right? If you're going to smoke cigarettes, if you're going to continue drinking, yes. you know, three to five cocktails an evening, and if you're not going to eat well and, and, um, heal your gut health, which we didn't even talk about, but that's just a no brainer, right? We have to have a healthy gut, healthy gut microbiome. Um, you know, how, given that someone's doing all the things, yes. how long until we should see some type of results? So the answer to your question is going to be approximately two to three months. And a lot of the studies are based on that. And that's because your skin cell turnover takes around anywhere between, I would say, 28 to 36 days. So I always say at least two months for it to be really clinically relevant that you can actually see the 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 improvement. So the message is don't don't give up, push through, but but you know, the the improvement. Of, of course, for topical products, right, it happens very slowly, but that's normal. And but if you couple it with procedural things, then you should definitely be able to see the impact much faster. But if you're only relying on the topical things, but if you do it all right, you know, in two months, you should see an impact. Yeah. I'm going to have to have you back so we can talk about all these different treatments and procedures that um, cost a lot of money. But, you know, if you pick the right one and you're with a trusted resource, um, your money could be well spent and, exactly. and spaced apart instead of being sold something every month that you have to come in and do. That, that is so through. 
I mean, that is so true because that is also true for the products that you, you know, that you choose, right? You don't yeah. have to be using all cosmeceutical grade products. And I tell the patients that all the time, you know, strategically, let's strategically poise ourselves, you know, in choosing what do we think that, you know, which product do we think we're going to best bang for your, you know, for your buck at this moment. And we can always work on adding things. And the other thing I want to also say is, is you know, it, it's really important that you want to rotate your skin products because we didn't really talk about that or, or you know, oh, or, mention or that. I didn't talk about that. Yeah, because that's because that's really important because your skin cells kind of get used to it. What you you should think of it this way. You always bear your workout routine, right? Mm, yeah. You don't always do the same thing, right? You know, you're right. Always, you know, forever be doing your bicep curls. You know, you're you know, you want to do some lats, you know, some pulls. I mean, you know, mm. like in all these different things, because you really want to, uh, uh, you know, subject your skin cells. That like you know, you you always want to try to you know maximize their potential, their capacity for regeneration, and mm. that's why you always want to use different things but partnering with somebody like yourself you know I mean that like that, that, like myself you know I'm you know you know I, I I'm always very conscious about you know how much are we spending and I always want my patients to get the best bang, best yeah. bang for their buck yeah, because this is a long-term lifestyle. We're committing to healthy skin long-term. It's only going to get harder as we age. Right. Um, so more maintenance is, is going to be needed. Um, tightening up your, your gut health, working on your diet, your nutrition, your stress, your sleep, your exercise, all of it really matters. It's all part of a healthy skin routine. Exactly. Uh, you know, they're all contributory. I yep. mean, it, it, it's good for our mental health. Uh, you know, everything really is a big picture. So it's not just about skin. It's about every organ in our body. Yeah. Well, Dr. Dai, thank you again so much for joining the Health Trip podcast. What a pleasure. We're going to have to have you back and talk about all those treatments because I know women are now just like in their head thinking, all right, what what treatment am I going to do? What am I going to invest in? Um, so wonderful to see you again. And um, thank you. Thank you so much again for all of this valuable, important information for us midlife women. You're very welcome. I had such a good time as always. And thank you everyone for tuning in. There's a lot, of, a lot of golden nuggets here and I'm going to be linking Dr. Dye's information, some of the products that I can find online. I'm going to put those in the links um, in the show notes as well. So um, be sure to read those after you're done listening to the podcast episode. Thanks again for joining us. Okay, bye. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Lifestyle changes can be hard and overwhelming to make. By building your support team of functional medicine doctors, therapists, and health coaches, you can reach your optimal health goals. Be sure to check out my other podcasts. Until we meet again, stay healthy.